already know, Janet sadly had a car crash last weekend. She's absolutely fine, um, but she's injured sufficiently to not be able to drive seven hours to get from Devon up here. So I'm afraid, although most of the things in there say that it will be chaired by her, you're stuck with me today. <laughs> so uh, I've stepped up to the plate, being a, a, a conference organiser of yesteryear, I think, Susie, with you. So uh, welcome to the conference and AGM. Um, in Ipswich, which is a long way down the A12, I discovered yesterday. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for, for joining us this year. I think Susie's got a couple of um, housekeeping announcements that she'd like to make. Um, so I'll pass briefly over to her before we get on with proper proceedings. Hello. Um, we're not expecting a fire alarm. <laughs> so if the alarm does go off, it is a real fire. <laughs> Um, and if you head down to the stairs, which is by where the lifts are, um, head downstairs through reception and congregate by the laid down big question mark. And uh, the staff will assist us. Uh, toilets are that way, <laughs> that way, <laughs> down to the open plan area. The turn right at the vending machines and the toilets around there. Um, if you have an accident, you must report it to reception. Um, she gets all the good jobs today. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and full health and safety policy is available to view on the website. <laughs> 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 we could actually say that. All right, we could put it up and we can all read. I will be asking you questions later. <laughs> so, no further okay. ado. <laughs> Okay, um, just a few introductions for those of you that don't know Susie. Susie does the uh, destinations um, and all sorts of other things, including helping to sort out events. Um, other people in the room, we've got Steve sitting at the back trying to hide. <laughs> Steve is the webmaster, for those who don't know Steve. Um, Kim, of course, used to be the webmaster and set up the original website. <laughs> um, and I take the role as, as secretary at the moment, but uh, a multitude of capacities today, I think. Um, Alex, of course, is not with us because she is based down in New Zealand. Um, Alex is our treasurer, um, but I'm sure she'll be doing Twitter and things later on. I can't have to be vying for the Twitter account, I think. <laughs> so um, first up today is me. Um, so I'll switch your clicker on. Um, with a rather entertainingly titled The Lifetimes and Migration in and Out of Porcupine. Um, when Janet said, um, would I do a talk at the conference? I said, well, yes, of course I'll do a talk. What do you want me to talk about? Thinking that she'd, talk, she'd asked me to talk about TechCot and LuffinCot, which are my two one-place studies that I've been doing for quite a long time and know quite a lot about. Oh, no, she wanted me to talk about Porcupine which I haven't actually registered um, as a one-place study, and it's kind of one of my, uh, my, my humorous ones. Now, I don't suppose many people know where porcupine is, do they? And I'm not talking about, <laughs> I'm not talking about this kind of a porcupine. <laughs> um, the reason I actually stumbled across porcupine, and I didn't realize it was a place either, um, was because I was writing a blog about animals and silly names and things like that, as I often do. Um, and I put porcupine into the 1911 census, you know, where you can put in the keyword search. And it came up with a couple of pubs called the Porcupine Inn or whatever. Um, and then it came up with a guy who was living in South Shields, but was born in Porcupine in Cornwall. And I thought, OK, that's news to me. I didn't realise there was a place called Porcupine. So I did a little bit of research. Now, this is where Porcupine actually is. Um, it's a sort of slightly smaller um, bit of the, the bottom of uh, Cornwall down near Fowey. Oh boy, I never know how to pronounce that. I think everyone says it differently, Kim. I went down there and I asked a couple of people. So I went there not so long back and I got about three or four different answers. <laughs> so I'd, I'll just stick with the way I say it. But um, you can see there's a pin in the map there. Um, and I do know how to pronounce this. To, to Wardrith, I'm not very good at pronouncing it, but To Wardrith is actually where um, Porcupine <laughs> is. So I've done a little bit of a bigger one there. It's actually, I've kept the, kept the pink road straight, which I was quite pleased with. <laughs> but it's part of To Wardrith Highway. Um, and you can see it's quite a small place um, at the top of Driving Lane, quite originally, <laughs> quite originally titled. Now, if anybody in the room has been to Cornwall, you'll know that a lot of those lanes are tiny. And in fact, I used to have quite, well, my, I now drive an Audi, which is not particularly high off the ground either. But I used to drive, um, an, a, not an old MG, but uh, a, a fairly low MG Rover. And uh, going down some of the roads is quite interesting because... Only tractors go down, so they have grass still in the middle of the road, and it kind of scuffs underneath the middle of the uh, 
the undercarriage of the car. Um, thankfully, Porcupine is a little better than that in some places. And I actually visited there the other day. And this is what used to be the Porcupine Inn. Um, I'll tell you a little, little bit more about that in a minute. But this is what used to be the Porcupine Inn. And uh, there it is, Porcupine House, it's now called. Yes. I thought I'd stop you this. Um, I was in a place called the Porcupine, it's a store, yeah. uh, in Woodstock the other day. And okay. I said, excuse me, <laughs> do you even have porcupines in the UK? Yeah. And I don't, he said, I don't think so. So I'm led to, to ask, were they here and become extinct here? I have no idea. Or did that name come from another, you know? Well, the reason for this, I'll come to, and it's not oh, nothing okay. to do with the animal. <laughs> yeah, no. The reason for this is yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't do my porcupine homework on that side of things. My dogs have been have had crabby attacked porcupine, and I paid three thousand dollars to have a So it's a significant issue. Yeah. <laughs> But this this is nothing to do with the animal. So this is Porcupine House, literally taken uh, about a month ago. And uh, if you blink, you actually do entirely miss Porcupine. <laughs> it's at the top of Towardrith Highway, um, and there's Porcupine Lane. Um, and I literally stopped, wound down the window, took the, <laughs> took the picture, and then drove back into Towardrith. So it's very, very small. It's, it's basically a hamlet. And the reason for um, it actually being called porcupine is that the magistrates court used to meet in um, what used to be called the golden fleece which is that house I was showing you the golden fleece pub and the inn received its curious name after the magistrates who met there his real name was Mr Rundle but he was nicknamed old prickly back and that's where the name porcupine came from um, it's halfway up this wonderful wonderful Cornish name Penpillock Hill um, and that area is still called porcupine there's a, an area that's also called Par, which is not very um, far away. And there's lots of little hamlets, actually, of Tawardreth. Um, and I also found some other information. There's, uh, it, it used to be used as an inn up to about the early 1860s. And then uh, it was converted. Uh, so I've done a little bit of census work to kind of try and find out who was there and so on and so forth. Um, I was quite interested to know that Thomas Cock was the uh, innkeeper at Porcupine, and he actually went bankrupt. Now, normally, what I would do with Tatcott, Luffincott, and other studies that I do, family history and so on, is throw the, the word into the discovery catalogue on the National Archives site. And even Luffincott comes up with quite a few different things. No, I didn't put Thomas Cock in there. <laughs> I know someone was laughing because of that. <laughs> but I did put in Porcupine, and there's only nine references. There's only nine bits of archival material on porcupine. So you can guess that I haven't got enormously far with a one-place study with only nine pieces of material. But this is um, one of the pieces of material. I actually went down to Cornwall Record Office for the first time about three or four months ago um, after Janet persuaded me to do the talk on porcupine. Um, and this is basically the entire area of porcupine from um, a lease map. Um, from yesteryear, not actually too far back, um, because it really only became recognised um, as a hamlet. So in the 1841 census, it gets a little bit of a mention, and then as it goes through each of the censuses, there are more people in Porcupine. Well, that's not because there's more people living in a particular property, it's because more properties are there. So you can see that there are um, a fair few shafts because it was a mining area. There are lots of people um, that worked in mining. So, as I say, what records are actually going to be available to me for Porcupine? And what were the reasons for migration from Porcupine? Well, interesting questions. As I say, the records side of things is actually very difficult because you can't put into census records, I'd like to have everything for Porcupine because it doesn't come up. It's not recognised as a parish, it's a hamlet. So normally for Tetcot, I would put in the place and go through and be able to download all the images, or whatever place you were doing, you'd do the same. But for this, I have to go through page by page by page by page of Tawardreth to find where Porcupine is. Hope to God they actually label it as Porcupine, because it's only part of the village, really, as a small hamlet, and often it's not even marked. Um, and as I mentioned, these nine records that are there from the National Archives Discovery Catalogue, 
some of them actually don't really help me at all. I've done some map work um, and so on. And I went to, as I was saying, I went down to Cornwall uh, Records Office and I thought, OK, I'm going to go through all the baptisms for Tawardrith and I'm going to pull out anyone whose abode, whose residence is Porcupine. Guess what? Zero. Correct. <laughs> Absolutely none. So I went through the entire parish and not one person apparently lived in Porcupine that was baptised between 1837 and I can't remember what date it finished, but well into the 1900s. Well, that was a bit of a waste of time, wasn't it? I went through the marriage records. Guess what? None. So nobody actually recognised their residence in the parish records as Porcupine. Not even the person who lived at Porcupine Inn at any particular census. <laughs> So, not particularly easy to do this. I'll come back to the question about migration. This, I've, I've done a quick um, screenshot of some of the um, census records that there are. This is the bottom of one page, which is the only reference. There are five people on this part and three at the top of the next, um, the next page on the 1841 census. So you've got William Arundel, who was a publican at Porcupine. Very helpfully, he was born in County, but we don't actually know whether he was born in Porcupine, of course. 1841 census, don't we love it? Um, but he was there with his family and probably a couple of servants, but we all know 1841 census doesn't actually tell you that. But he's got a couple of people with different surnames um, on the next page, because you can see that the youngest child there is nine months, so the, the next page is just a, a few servants. But then move on to the 1851 census. We've still got innkeeper. Um, we've got a couple of children, we've got um, sons, daughters and two house servants at the bottom there. So it's still being used, this porcupine, the only reference, this actually says at the top there, not particularly good, but that's porcupine in, and it's on to Wardrith Highway, that's what they refer to it as. 1861, I have no idea. <coughs> porcupine is not referenced at all in the whole of Towardrith in 1861. I can make a guess at who was there, but I'm probably not right, I don't think, at the moment. Um, so we go forward to the 1871, and this is the guy who's living at the Porcupine. He's not an innkeeper. So you can see where the, the change from the Porcupine being an inn transfers into it being used just as a house. So that's why it's called the Porcupine House now. Um, it's actually used as a bed and breakfast now. So when you put in Porcupine, amongst other things, Porcupine House comes up if you're actually looking for the place um, down there, but very little else. So you've got Thomas Crocker. I thought originally that this might be the same innkeeper that they were talking about being bankrupt, but slightly slightly different uh, different surname. And you can see that he was born on the far right hand side there into Wardrith. So he's just gone slightly up the highway. Um, and is living up in the Porcupine House. He stays there um, till 1881 um, as well. And I can track it all the way through. So if we're thinking about migration, these four are what Janet did for her thesis, for her doctorate actually, faith, fish, farm, family, or mining. She didn't put that one, that's mine. <laughs> um, the reasons that I've discovered so far really um, for anyone to move in and out and round and about from um, Porcupine are work. If they were an innkeeper there, they just moved on to an innkeeper somewhere else. But the chap that actually first spurred my interest in Porcupine was this chap who was in South Shields. Well, that's quite a long way from Cornwall. And he was a miner. He was actually a coal miner, which isn't the same kind of mining that they did. It was copper mining um, in the area where Porcupine is. But clearly he was in mining um, and he decided that he was going to move quite a long way. <laughs> um, married a lady from South Shields and all of their children were born up in South Shields. But the migration is actually quite hard for such a small place. For me, with my other studies, it's much easier to say, OK, well, they've gone to the next village, blah, 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 blah. But we're talking a very small number of people. So the entire family will move. So that William Arundel, the whole family goes somewhere else and runs a different inn and they move completely to a different place in Cornwall. So it's not the same kind of migration that perhaps other people will be looking at in their own studies. Um, I don't have any fish connections with this particular place because it's quite inland. So there are no people that there aren't anybody, sorry, there isn't anybody that would actually be getting up 
from porcupine and going somewhere else to fish somewhere else on the coast. They're not particularly religious from what I can see. I don't think they baptise any children at all from porcupine. I think they just don't bother. <laughs> Either that or they just don't see it as their abode. They just put to order. But the families are always staying pretty close together. They're not moving particularly far away from one another and they're staying together um, as a unit. So it's quite an interesting study. <laughs> the smaller the study I actually have discovered, the harder it is to do the migration, the shared endeavour that we've been doing as a society this year. Because, as I say, with tech cotton Luff and Cot, you can see it a little bit more clearly, but with this, you've just got the one house. Now, as I said, I've showed you on the pictures earlier on, I've, I've been down there quite recently. You go up Porcupine Lane, there are about four houses, and then if you go much further, you struggle to do a 64-point turn to come back down the road again <laughs> before you end up in farmland. So it's very much a hamlet. And as I say, that makes things quite a lot harder than perhaps some of the migration work that you're doing. So that's a very brief um, talk about my porcupine study, but it's a very small place, so you can't talk very long about a small place. So that's to give you a little bit of a, a, an interesting start to the day. Um, has anybody got, got any questions that they'd like to ask on that, Kim? Um, a couple of things. One, I think you said it, it, it was William Randall. Is it Aaron Randall? I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, William Arundel in 1841. So, was he the one who came from South Shields? No. It, the, no, the, the chap who went to South Shields no. was uh, a John somebody or other, but that's a 1911 census. That was oh, much later okay, in terms of migration. Arundel is such a big name in Cornwall yeah. that yeah. he's been up in Durham. Durham yeah. Um, that's interesting. The other thing I just find mention that when I was reading about in, uh, in, in my parish, uh, the lack of a baptism record, um, for the most part, um, I'm assuming nonconformity. Mm -hmm. And it was huge in Cornwall, the yeah. Methodism, so it might be uh, that if you can find any of the, um, the nonconformist non baptism yeah. records, you might be able there to. There is a nonconformist church, I think it's in Parr, which is another one yeah. of the, the outlying hamlets of, um, of Tawardrith. But I haven't found the record. Yeah, yet. especially amongst the mining community. Yeah, it's like this is absolutely. That might be yeah, big. absolutely. I mean, I, I have that in my surname study that a lot yeah. of my surname study names will be in the local sort of Wesleyan circuit records and so on. So yeah, yeah. it's a good one. Steve. No, they're not. It doesn't even feature because it's such. I mean, that map, if I just go back a couple of slides to that map, that was from the early 1900s, um, that map. And it, it's really only expanded, I think the 1891 was the first one where there was sort of five different households. And that's remained fairly static since, um, you know, up to the 1911 and so on and so forth. Haven't done the 1939 register, but that's a completely different discussion, probably. <laughs> Having been somewhere else at a family history meeting this week. <laughs> But yeah, so so no, it hasn't featured on there at all. Is Lynn. there a temptation to expand it to the parish? No. To, to, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I mean, the, the, the reason why I picked it was completely for a humorous reason. I have no connection with the parish, you know, family-wise. It's just the, the humour factor, to be honest. Um, so, no, I've, Towardrith is actually a very large place, um, certainly now, in terms of physically going and, and, and travelling around, but, but no. <laughs> Any other questions? So where are you going to go with this? Good question. Yeah, well, I haven't registered it yet, so I could just ditch it, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> humour value's gone. <laughs> No, I, I'd, I'd quite like to know a little bit more about why people landed up running that porcupine in yeah. and where their lives went after that. I think that's my main kind of driver. Um, the migration side of things I've been doing because of the shared endeavour that we've been looking at, but really it doesn't fit that well because it is literally up sticks, whole family, off you go. So really that's been quite hard to do. But yeah, I'd just like to see where, why they came there in the first place, where they came from and what, then where they went afterwards. I'd like to know more about this this yeah. guy that, that was bankrupted as well. Yeah. Not just for the humour factor of his name, but... <laughs> Do you know why he was there? Is it a, a route? It's, it's a route there? out, yeah. It's a route out to sort of what, what is now a fairly main road, the Towardrith Highway, which goes back... Um, if I go back to the map. There. So it goes... The A390, it's, it's on the A390, so it's just heading out. Um, 
I beg your pardon? Cornwall. No. Oh, sorry. Porcupine on there. Porcupine is where the dot is. So that's a bigger version. So it's in the, it's just on the um, north side of Towardley Highway. It says porcupine on the right. I know, the pin's in a different place. Google Maps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't start you off, Peter. <laughs> Yeah, that book. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. Sorry, I can't. I haven't got glasses, but we'll look at that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be the glasses for you. Yeah, it's just there. <laughs> so, would the river have continued? The Foy River would have continued up to Porcupine. No, no. The Foy River um, is just there at the bottom, um, yeah. but there, there's no river. There's no um, waterways at. Right? No, no, not at all. Because yeah, it means quite a wide range of. Yeah, but it doesn't go through Porcupine itself. No. no. Then what have you done anything about the land holding? Like, who's farming the area around it? Are they living somewhere they might possibly not living in porcupine? No. Presumably. Um, and is that in stable hands? Does that I don't know, I haven't looked at that. Yeah. I haven't looked at that at all. Yeah. It's just as I say, the human value of the porcupine yeah. bit really. <laughs> I just extended it further than I perhaps should have done. <laughs> Brenda. <laughs> Charlie, she brought them mm -hmm. up in this chapel, so I was just yeah. talking about that. Mm -hmm. They would, it, it supports that they might have been doing so, but they didn't have a place to work behind an introductory place that was more significant in terms of its understanding what mm -hmm. the place mm -hmm. meant for the wider population, yeah. and therefore yeah. the name of Highway, yeah. or a more significant for the village or family. Yeah. Makes sense. I mean, Porcupine Lane, I think, was only named, not even in the 1911 census, that doesn't feature. Um, so that's come across, come you know later on. Of course, makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's it's interesting, isn't it? That they chose to name it from old creepy cat. They chose yeah. an animal, but it's not made of goo. Why yeah. Not it? It's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was me. Maybe prickly back was a bit of prickly back something else. Yeah. Maybe a fish. Yeah. You know. I don't know. No, prickly means he's easily irritated. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing how much discussion you can get out of the porcupine, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I think if there's no more questions, we'll have a brief, brief switch over, and Janet's going to grace us with her presence. About. <laughs> I would. Do you want the, uh, the clicker? I'll have the clicker, yeah. So that's just forwards and that's backwards. That's forwards, but if you want the laser, yeah, it's just that. Right. Thank you very much. Mine is the migration, that one. Yeah, that one. Hi, good morning and thank you. I was uh, sat in the beer garden in Weatherspoons at Who Do You Think You Are with Janet Few and a few others, and she looked around and said, uh, anybody fancy speaking at the conference then? And I thought, mm, yeah, yeah, all right. And I'm sat here now thinking, why on earth was that ever a good idea? But here we go. Slight change to the published title, uh, but using examples of textile and migration from my place. Whoop, come on. Uh, that doesn't work. Okay, that does. That's Spring Hill, all 12 houses of it. So there's going to be a few common themes between my talk and Kirsty's. <laughs> and the first one is the difficulty of doing anything in small places. <laughs> It doesn't help that there's lots of different names for the place and there's lots of different ways of spelling it. The Baptist church that we'll refer to later is just in that clump of um, houses, of trees there. And for those of you that aren't familiar with East Lancashire Hamlets, we're there. So you've got Manchester, Preston, Bradford, uh, Bury, Burnley, just to give you some idea of roughly where we're talking about. Now, I don't know if this applies to anybody here. But I really envy those of you that have got a parish that have ecclesiastical boundaries that are the same as the civil boundaries, <laughs> that have stayed the same over time, that are coterminous with the census. I envy you guys. You lucky girl. You lucky look. Because <laughs> this is just some of the names that this area has been known with over the past 500 years. Anybody else got a place that's named after a cow shed? <laughs> I mean, come on. And if you think of the number of ways you could spell Deadwing Clough, one word, two, <laughs> with or without the A's, with or without the Q. Yeah, okay. 
And that's the traditional image of textiles in East Lancashire. It was subsistence farming supplemented by hand loom weaving upstairs with the rest of the family downstairs spinning, run by the Chapman. And it went on like that until the, roughly about 1800. And you know the history of the Industrial Revolution from school history. And this lot came through towards the eight, end of the 18th century. And cotton was first recorded in our area in about 1770. Before that, it was mainly wool. And so we started with the industrial system. That's the drawing and roving machine at the top and the spinning machine at the bottom. And then there was a weaving shed a bit further on. And suddenly, the place was flooded. The hand loom weavers couldn't keep up. And within about 200 yards of my place, there were the uh, hand loom weaver riots and the loom smashing in 1826. So why, why Rosendale? Why my area? What do you need for cotton? Well, you need livers. They are well, let's go to Salford. You need coal for the steam mills, so we've got coal. Sprinkles here, by the way. And we've got transport. The road was turnpiked in 1814. The railways came in in 1830-something. So between them, you suddenly found that you had a sprouting of mainly cotton, some wool, some felt, some slipper mills, all along the valley bottoms that show the maps you had earlier. And with that, we've got the sprouting of the collieries. And that shows, that's the same rivers. And we've got shows where the collieries are. Now, the coal was pretty poor quality. The seams ranged between 18 inches and 5 feet thick, but it was local and it was good enough to drive the mills. And those collieries were all owned by a chap called John Ashworth, who built the main house in Spring Hill in 1840, and we'll come back to him later. The second common theme is the miners came from Cornwall. And they came, there were tin miners in Cornwall, came up to East Lancashire, did the coal mining, brought their local traditions with them. And this is the local dance troupe that still do the traditional Cornish dances, they claim, <laughs> and claim that their black up is from the colour that the man's faces were when they came out of the mine. And there were a range of trades that were involved. It wasn't just coal and quarrymen, and it wasn't just people to work the textiles. Clockmakers, journeymen, toothpickers, pinions, you need people to work the machines, you need people to shoe the horses. The implications were actually quite wide. But anyway, to give some idea of the growth, by 1850, nearly half of the world's cotton spindles were in East Lancashire, were in Lancashire, and I find that quite staggering. And then, of course, you've not just got the spinning, you've got the weaving, you've got dyeing, you've got calico printing, you've got wool, you've got felt. It was a huge, huge industry. And this had to be stopped by somebody. And this is 1838, and just shows the concentration and the number of cotton employees in the East Lancashire area. And as I said, these are mainly cotton people. This is only the cotton people. Now, it's a wee bit tricky. This is from the census. Because the township boundaries changed about there. Anybody else have that problem? Yes. But you get the idea, don't you? I and mean, people moved in, lots of them. And that led to the stereotypical picture of East Lancashire, where you have the mills on the bottom, the back-to-back -back houses, people to live in, the odd handling cottage that still survives, and of course the chapel. And that's Bakeup, which is about four miles up the road from me. Sorry, the old handling cottage? Handling weavers. Oh, handling. Sorry. <coughs> This is 1861. I'm sorry, my labelling isn't as good as Kirsty's. <laughs> <laughs> and although two thirds of the cotton workers in East Lancashire were born in the county, all the examples are from Spring Hill or from the 12 houses or so that we saw earlier. We do indeed have a power cotton weaver, a spinner, sorry. No, weaver. Who comes from Yorkshire? So there are people who are coming in from outside to work the mills. But bear in mind when you look at this, that you see figures for so many people that came within county. And Yorkshire is five miles away. 
Lancashire stretches as far as Barrow and Furness, which is 90 miles. So you could come a considerable distance, but still be regarded in these things as being in counter. That's quite a famous poster from one of the local mills, and we can have a bit of a giggle with some of the rules. Some of them are quite quaint. <laughs> some of them are aimed at improving general hygiene. Does anybody have a washing check at work? <laughs> But it was actually, you know, the hours were long, the wheels were hard, the fines could be quite significant, the pay wasn't that fantastic, and the conditions were quite, uh, quite steep. So starting in 1833, we had the Factory Act, the first of a series of them, that aimed at reducing the hours and improving the conditions of the people who were working in this system. And one of the things that they brought in were the factory inspectors, so we find Springfield resident Charles Patrick, sub-inspector of factories, and he covered quite a large area, actually. And where did he come from? Middlesex. And now he, he is a one-place migration in himself, because he started at Middlesex, ended up via Edinburgh, Lincolnshire, Canada, Rochdale, then to Spring Hill, and his final journey from the five miles from Rochdale to Spring Hill was nothing to do with textiles because he married the daughter of the colliery owner that we talked about earlier. So his final journey to Rosendale was for love, not for textiles. <laughs> there you go. A second thing that is said is that as the mills developed, they became quite attractive areas of employment for the local girls. And so People who would otherwise have gone into domestic service then went into the mill, which led to a demand for domestic <laughs> servants who came from outside the area, a lot of whom came from other um, agricultural areas. So if you, your place has ag labs that disappear around about the mid-19th century, they might end up in Lancashire in service. So 1851, Mary Ann Ashworth, not yet married, landed proprietor born in the township with a servant who was also born in the same township. 1861, she's now married. And with marriage comes five more servants, none of whom were buried locally. Yeah. Now, quite why when she took a husband, she had an urgent desire to get a groom, a butler, um, I can't remember the rest of them, a carriageman. I think he was an expensive man to keep. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> No, she inherited in uh, 1845. No, 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 no. I think uh, he was a man who, who knew money when he saw it and he married well. Mary Sorry? Mary Yeah, Mary, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. This is 1881, and this is also my direct ancestry as well as a local resident. They weren't living in, the town, in my place at the time, they did later. James Stott born on the Alanx Yorks border, four miles away, with his wife and his child, who were also born in the area, living in Lancashire. She was born in 1865 in Stockton on Tees, and that's a third connection. We've got a County Durham connection as well. And then by 1881, they're back in Lancashire. Why was she in Stockton in 1865? Well, the cotton had to come from somewhere. And it came from the plantations of the Confederate States. And I think you're, I've no evidence that anybody from Spring Hill was directly involved in the slave trade, but they certainly benefited from it. And not everybody who migrated due to textiles actually chose to do so. That's the Lincoln Memorial in Manchester. And 1862 65 was the Unionist blockade of the Confederate ports, which led to reduction in the export of cotton and the cotton famine in East Lancashire. A lot of the mills closed, a lot of the people were put in poverty, and a lot of the people moved. 
And that family moved to Stockton on Tees, which got more cotton from India and Egypt and less from America. And therefore, there were more jobs and more survival there, or survival of the trade there. Lincoln Memorial was in Manchester after a letter from the Mill Girls in Staley Bridge, actually, in Cheshire, to Lincoln saying, yes, this is causing us hardship, but we believe what you're doing is right. And we want you to stand firm and don't worry about the, you know, we are behind you despite the fact that we are suffering. And his reply to them, said, thanking them for their encouragement. Their text is on one place, his reply is on the other. He was my local resident, lived in the area in 1901, was the son of a big cotton owning dynasty. And interestingly, all that lot <coughs> built an enormous house, subdivided it into sub dwellings, and then took lots as to who was living which one. But anyway. And he was a wool buyer for the felt trade, actually. They made their money in cotton, but he was buying for felt. And five years later, he pops up in Southport on the coast near Liverpool, probably for family reasons, but continued to buy for the Rosendale for the local felt trade. St Anne's on Sea, just south of Blackpool, was founded as a capitalist venture, a business venture by industrialists from my wider area who rented the land from the Earl of Clifton, quarried local stone and took it out there, um, built pretty much the town. But then as the town became established, the idea of retiring to the seaside after a lifetime of hard work became something to which people began to aspire. And these are all gravestones in the local chapel that I pointed out earlier of people who had lived and worked and worshipped in the Spring Hill area, but had all died in St Anne's, mm. and were either buried or commemorated in their local churchyard. Next aspect is that after World War II, there was a shortage of labour in Britain. There was a reluctance among some of the local labour force to do nights, weekends, unpopular shifts. Well, that's not changed. Um, and there was competition from the developing textile market in other parts of the world. And that led to the immigration of people from South Asia into East Lancashire to supply the mills. And in my area, they came from three main places. Siliet, northeast of Bangladesh. Attuk, uh, where's East Lancashire? Attuk, there. And Merthyr, over there. I don't have any in Spring Hill itself who have come from that area. But now 5% of the wider Rosendale population is of South Asian origin. Just a cautionary note about census data. Street check claims to be based on your postcode from the 2011 census. And that is what they claim is the ethnic breakdown of the people who live in that area. Spring Hill itself is there. Now, I know pretty much everybody who lives in that area. I've lived there 20 odd years. I know them all. I have yet to see the Chinese. <laughs> I do not know who the six Bangladeshis are. I do know the other Asian, of which there are more than one Pakistani. So I am not convinced that that data is entirely accurate. <laughs> now, there's an interesting paper in the local historian, the Bala Journal, from earlier last year, comparing tall housekeepers from the census and the parliamentary records, and there was a discrepancy between the two. Now, people may or may not lie about their ethnic origin. We certainly have quite a few Jedi Knights. <laughs> <laughs> so although the census is possibly the best we've got for some of this data, you still have to take with a pinch of salt the stuff it says. Today, well, the mills have all gone. There's very little textile manufacture in the area. What is is specialist and usually medical. That is a stylized view of the, um, the view from the museum, which is an old mill owner's house looking out over the valley. There's a couple of mills have been converted into uh, units. A couple have been converted into flats. A couple are award-winning museums. 
And sadly, the ones that are award-winning museums are now under threat because Lancashire County Council is uh, probably going to pull the funding in April, which is really, really sad. But thank you for listening. Any questions? Who drew that picture? <laughs> 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 the only answer is I can't remember, but I can find out for you. I was just curious. No, it's, uh, it wasn't me. I wish it was. This area is Rosendale. Rosendale, yeah. Right. Um, coincidentally, my grandmother, who's I've been in the year and been her at Bank of Family, is from Stratford. Yeah. She married in Rottenstall. Yeah. And to a man whose family had come from Ely. Ely in Cambridgeshire? Yeah. <laughs> now, they were Ely Eastage. That's really interesting because I've got a few Spring Hill residents who were born or whose families, I think most of them were born in Rosendale, but their wider families were born in Ely um, or surrounding area. And one of them went back and married a girl from Ely and then brought her back up to Rosendale. Whether it was the same family by coincidence or whether there were a few of them. So I've not actually been able to trace what those specific pull factors were. They were stone quarriers rather than textile workers, so I've not included them in this. But, I probably would have said I've not worked much enough yeah. outside the family of my year and having yeah. Various illegitimacies that have yet to be proved. So, sort of, <laughs> that, that, and this was a first marriage. Mm. We had an interesting mining industry in that area, mm. uh, Copperlite. Mm. Not that yeah. mining in the Fens, though, just makes us feel. Oh, Copperlite! That's what I'm saying, Copperlite! In the Fens, Copperlite! Oh, yeah, it's not. Really? So, I mean, you might not call it. Not mining, digging it out. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> most of my most of my Cambridge people, sorry, most of my Cambridge inward migrants are stone quarriers or stonemasons, and there was a quarry on the hill about three quarters of a mile away, three quarters of a mile steeply up. Uh, well, that's really interesting because when you said um, I, I was I've been studying this Eslick family, which is a branch of Eastlake that was down in Cornwall. And they were in the great exodus of the 1860s. And nowadays, there's a whole bunch of Eslicks and Eastlakes up in Northumberland, Durham. Mm -hmm. And I immediately thought, I, I just assumed, oh, yeah, they went up there to do coal mining. But when I ended up looking at the individuals in my family, they weren't. They were hard rock miners. And they weren't going. They got up there, but I haven't figured out yet. If they were really going into coal, they were going into some sort of mining, but I wondered if there was other types of mining because I just could not find as like these like coal miners. I, I knew, yeah, I know the families went up there, so I just wondered if you just what if you had any more information on the extent of Cornish hard rock miners going to populate the collier, collier region. Collier region. I can't say I've looked into that in any detail. Yeah. The ones that came to East Lancashire were said to be tin miners mm -hmm. who came up here and mined coal. Uh, okay. But whether whether that's true or not, I don't know, because I haven't looked into that in detail. It's just slightly wider. It's quite interesting what the new, you know, what we can do now, and because of the wider availability of the mm. whole censuses yeah. there, so what is now mm. out there especially for on the academic side you know where you've got the whole lot um rather than yeah. you know, looking at individuals because mm. this sort of myth that half east anglia upped and went to lancashire or mm -hmm. yorkshire which was you know very poor suffolk say um, <coughs> lots of people moved and obviously there were some, I mean, yeah. one very famous sort of movement of lots of people from suffer, organised movement. But actually, when people have analysed all the census, mm. you know, the whole, 
it's actually, you know, most people are local. Yes. And most people are moving in from the rural areas in Lancashire. There's an interesting study as well that was done in Accrington, which is about six, eight miles away. That's largely a calico town. Yeah. Uh, there is cotton, there is, there is wool, yeah. but it's largely calico. And they showed that a lot of the migration was local. Yeah. The less skilled the worker, the closer that they moved. Yeah. But even so, they tended to move from areas with a calico trade to Accrington to work in the calico industry. And that those who had come further distances yeah. tend to be more skilled um, and more specialist. Yeah. And again, more from, yeah. from places with a known calico yeah. background. Um, Did you look at whether your communities were dry? Sorry? Did you look at whether communities were dry, whether there were no um, pubs or licensed? <laughs> well, there's plenty of pubs. There were temperate communities, though, weren't there? Temperate campaign, or possibly unsuccessful. <laughs> the Baptist church that was in the clump of trees had a very active band of hope movement, but the wider village still had at least three beer houses. <laughs> so uh, I think they existed in parallel. I think somewhere like Saltaire was dry, wasn't it? Saltaire was dry, yes. Saltaire was dry, which was a classic Yes. <laughs> Since that in some parts of Wales, I think, well, yeah. but that's a different country. Yeah. That, that couple, um, between them own pretty much the entire village for about two miles either side. You know, one of them owned, inherit, the, the lady inherited half of it and the gentleman bought up the other half. And they had, they celebrated their wedding with um, a reception in the pub for the tenancy and then they celebrated something else with a reception in the pub for the tenancy. I don't think the odd, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't averse to the odd part of them, no. Well, one of the reasons I asked is that we certainly learned in Canadian um, the forestry industry, that when you've got heavy equipment moving around and shovels and things like I think would have been in the cotton mine, uh, cotton industry, um, it's dangerous mm. if you've had tipples for lunch. Yes. So I thought there might have been something going on, which is the kind of thing in itself. Right. Yeah. Well, they were all under 10 when you put them in that mine. <laughs> 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 well, that's nothing. I heard that. Um, there was a <coughs> trains arranged from Cornwall uh, to take workers up to break strikes <coughs> up in uh, in well, the textile. Do you know anything about that? Yeah. The other thing we saw from Mark's family, who was uh, one of those wealthy uh, weaving families from um, <laughs> Victorian London and ended up in the workhouse, but um, <laughs> um, that we saw, we, we had. Uh, one little girl we were tracing who'd been shipped from the uh, Chelsea uh, Asylum, uh, Orphans Asylum, up there to the mills. And we got to looking and were astounded at the number of children from the London workhouse mm. who were uh, shown yeah. to have been yeah. taken up there. And I didn't know how much yeah. you, you saw that. And, we, and it was it's really hard to find out how long those children were in the mills and exactly what happened to them uh, when when they left the mills. We have big gaps in, yeah. in some of those stories. So, do you, uh, Chelsea, I was going to say, someone planned to work from the London end. I don't know who, but I know I've read something from the London mm -hmm. end about the ship. Yeah. Yeah, there, there were. Um, I there said, in my personal ancestry, I was, I have, um, a guy who was born in Wiltshire in 1861 who disappeared and then pops up as a block as a calico block printer in Lancashire in 1891 and I've no idea where he was in 1871 and 1881 and somebody over dinner said he was in a ditch with one of their missing ancestors who was missing, <laughs> missing from the same two censuses so yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's quite possibly true but <laughs> Which leads me to another common common feature in my study in Kirsty's is that there's no fish because we're 40 miles from the sea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there is. I mean, I tried to keep it as far as possible to local residents, so I didn't have any examples of those, but yeah, there were loads of them shipped in. But interestingly, the majority of people who worked in the mills were still local, and it was then the gaps that they filled that people were moving in, particularly the service side. 
But there's so many people that worked in the mills that they still needed to attract from outside just to fill them with places. I'm just convinced that she's vision through and through. I'm not so many celebrity or people sort of thing, yeah. And uh, but three generations back, three quarters of the people came from elsewhere. Yeah. From the uh, from Leafy Hampshire, East End of London, yeah. and other places on the on, on the on the east side of the country we uh, talk about in Hampshire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that place. <laughs> When I said at work once that I was doing my family history, one of my colleagues said, do you think you'll ever go back to where the roots are? And I said, well, with, apart from the Wiltshire exception, virtually everybody for the last 200 years was born within about a mile and a half of where I live now. I don't have far to go. Really. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a bit stretching it, but on one side, that's actually true. Thank you. Thank you.